On November 15, 2007, a flight instructor and two foreign student pilots were participating in a routine cross-country flight when something went terribly wrong and their airplane broke apart in midair and plummeted to the ground and they were killed instantly. This was a terrible tragedy, and the investigation that followed would reveal shocking details about the actions of a rogue flight instructor, but I'm gonna challenge you to open your mind a little because in my opinion, that was only half of the story. I'm Hoover, and welcome to your Pilot Debrief. Our story begins just south of Fort Worth, Texas at a small airfield called Arlington Municipal Airport. A relatively new instructor pilot was taking two Italian students on a cross-country flight to Abilene, Texas in order to give them some additional flight time in order to expose them more to the radio communications since English wasn't their primary language. When they were about halfway to Abilene, a witness that was working on the ranch where they crashed said that he heard whirling sounds as if the airplane was spinning and then he heard a loud bang. When he walked out of the barn, he saw pieces of the aircraft falling to the ground. There were no radio calls from the pilots to declare an emergency, or if there were, then no one heard them. The debris field was scattered over an area one mile long by a half mile wide, and the aircraft was broken into six major sections. The first person of interest in the investigation was the flight instructor. This is a photo of Robert, or just Robbie as he was known to his friends and family. He was only 29 years old and he was the flight instructor, and I'm not going to share his last name because that's not the point of this debrief. It's important to remember that these debriefs are about real people, and our goal is always to try to learn what we can from these tragedies in order to prevent another one from happening. Robbie served as a Marine, then he was a firefighter, and he was working as a certified flight instructor. He left behind three young children, and my heart goes out to his family and friends because this tragedy could have been prevented. I also want to clarify that even though the word rogue can mean a dishonest or unreliable person, in the context of this pilot debrief, it's intended to mean someone that behaves in an independent and uncontrolled way that isn't authorized, normal, or expected. Robbie wasn't a bad person, he just made some bad decisions, and I hope that those of you watching will agree with me by the time the video is over. Robbie obtained his private pilot certificate on January 22nd, 2004. His next recorded flight isn't until three years later on February 28th, 2007, when it seems he dedicated himself to flying as much as possible. And over the course of the next five months, he earned a certificate for single engine land, multi-engine land, and an instrument rating on July 18th, 2007. Just two days later, he became a certified flight instructor and within the next five days, he completed his new flight instructor training at the flight school he was working at. This pace of training and upgrade is very similar to what we're seeing in the aviation community today. Now, back in 2007, all of the legacy airlines were out of bankruptcy and the national and the regional airlines were hiring like crazy. Flight schools had a really tough time keeping instructors around because as soon as they got a few hundred hours, they were headed off to the airlines. And my guess is that was what Robbie hoped to do one day. At the time of the crash, he had logged an estimated 595 hours, including approximately 307 hours in the last 90 days and 60 hours in the last 30 days. And to me, it just demonstrates a very rapid pace at which he was trying to build hours, but also demonstrates his level of dedication and commitment to flying. It's worth mentioning that Robbie only had 37 hours of flight time in the make and model of the aircraft that he crashed in, and before we go further into the details, I want to say that I wish I could have found photos of the two students that were killed in this crash because they were real people too and their lives were just as valuable. Luca was in the front and he was only 19 years old and he was supposed to return to Italy at the end of the month. Andrea was in the back seat and he was 28 years old and he dreamed of becoming an airline pilot. And unfortunately, both of their lives were cut short by this terrible tragedy. One of the most helpful parts of any mishap investigation, in my opinion, is the interviews. Now, it was obvious to the investigators that anyone that knew Robbie would say he was a great guy. A fellow flight instructor said Robbie was the best pilot he had ever flown with. Robbie's girlfriend, also a flight instructor, said she knew what he was doing and she felt completely safe with his flying abilities. Even the chief flight instructor for the flight school said that Robbie was one of his best instructors. He was impressed with his work ethic and had no complaints about him. This is what makes the debrief so hard for me sometimes because you have to try and remove some of the emotion from the equation. 
I have no doubt that Robbie was probably a good pilot and a great person. And it really sucks that this happened because what you're about to find out is that several people had a chance to prevent this tragedy, starting with the students. As a student pilot, there's a lot you don't know about flying when you first start. But the truth is you still have natural instincts that tell you when something doesn't feel right and you need to speak up when that happens. Andrea, who was the student pilot in the back of the plane, had sent an email to some friends in Italy about a week before the crash where he wrote, yesterday I flew as a passenger with a megalomaniac instructor. He then shared a little bit about the language barrier with the radio calls and then he writes, well, speaking of the megalomaniac instructor, yesterday during the flight, he took control and did two spin turns without any warning. It looked like I was thrown out of the aircraft since I did not fasten the seatbelt. We were not going to do acrobatics. Well, it was so amusing though. If you have to use the term megalomaniac to describe your flight instructor, it's time to get a new instructor. You should also get a new instructor if they're doing spins or other aerobatic maneuvers without warning you, and if they're letting you fly around without any restraints on. Now, technically, the email doesn't say who the instructor is, but Andrea had flown with Robbie at least once before. And I think, unfortunately, the fact that this is a foreign student just trying to make it through training meant that he was probably reluctant to raise any concerns about the instructor's behavior, also, it's likely he just thought this was normal and maybe even a little bit of fun without realizing the danger he was in. The NTSB also interviewed one of Robbie's students that had been working on getting his private pilot certificate. That individual said Robbie would do barrel rolls and spins with him in a Cessna 172 and that Robbie was a very good pilot. The problem with that is the Cessna 172 is not approved for aerobatic maneuvers, so they shouldn't have been doing any kind of rolls. And even though that aircraft is approved to do spins, that's not part of the normal syllabus for someone getting a private pilot certificate. Now, I'm not blaming the student for not knowing this, but if you think your instructor is doing something odd, then you need to ask another instructor, or better yet, ask those that are in charge of the flight school. However, there's a bigger problem. The flight instructor that said Robbie was the best pilot he had ever flown with also said that Robbie revealed to him that he had performed a snap roll in a few of the flight school airplanes. And if you're not familiar, a snap roll, which is also what the British call a flick roll, is essentially a horizontal spin. You can see an example of it in this video I found from an air show in 1987, showing how the pilot is going to aggressively pull back on the controls in order to exceed the critical angle of attack and induce an accelerated stall. Once the stall occurs, you push full rudder in the direction of the roll and you hold that throughout the roll, reducing the backstick pressure and applying opposite rudder to recover. The instructor said that he expressed his displeasure to Robbie about him doing snap rolls and because he never heard anything about it again, he just assumed that Robbie had stopped. Here's the thing though, I know that no one likes to be the person to go tell on somebody, especially when it can get someone fired, but the reality is that if you don't say anything, then this tragedy is an extreme example of the consequences. Next, we're gonna take a look at what exactly happened during the flight, and then I'm gonna share with you one last piece of shocking information that was discovered over a year after the tragedy. This is the aircraft they were flying. It's a 1973 Piper PA-28 that has retractable landing gear and was configured for four occupants. The aircraft had undergone an annual inspection about six weeks prior to the crash, and upon examining the wreckage at the crash site, there was no evidence of any pre-existing cracks in the structure and no significant corrosion was present. The NTSB used data provided by three different radar sites to identify five maneuvers of interest that took place just prior to the crash. This chart shows altitude on the left side and time is at the bottom. What you're seeing is that in four out of the five maneuvers, the aircraft is trading altitude for airspeed. Robbie is pitching the aircraft nose down, losing about 1,000 to 1,200 feet of altitude before climbing back up about 300 to 400 feet between maneuvers. This next chart shows you the airspeed for each maneuver. The dashed red line is the calibrated airspeed, and that's the one you want to focus on. You can see how in the first three maneuvers, as the aircraft loses altitude, the airspeed increased to just over 120 knots and then slowed back down to about 90 knots when the aircraft climbed back up in altitude. The fifth maneuver is the most aggressive though because that's where Robbie gets the fastest, 
reaching 134 knots before starting to slow back down and then the data stopped. There are two really important things that you need to know about this aircraft. The first is that it's not approved for spins or aerobatic maneuvers. The second thing is that the maximum maneuvering speed on the aircraft is only 116 knots. This chart shows a generic example to help explain maneuvering speed. Basically, if you're below maneuvering speed and you pull back aggressively on the controls, in most cases, you're going to stall the aircraft before you risk any structural damage. Once you get above maneuvering speed, if you pull back too hard, then you run the risk of damaging the aircraft before it stalls. On four out of five maneuvers, Robbie was exceeding the maximum maneuvering speed. And if he was trying to do a snap roll on that fifth maneuver, he would have pulled back aggressively on the controls, except this time the aircraft likely would have broken apart before he stalled. And that would explain why the aircraft was spinning as it fell in pieces to the ground. And this brings us to the most shocking part of the story. I shared with you some of the interviews that the NTSB conducted, but one of those individuals wouldn't agree to an interview until over a year after the tragedy, and that was the flight instructor that was Robbie's girlfriend. And I'm sure she carried a lot of guilt for a while after the tragedy because the student in the back of Robbie's plane was her student. She's the one that told Andrea to go on the flight with Robbie in order to get more exposure to the radio calls. She even had lunch with Robbie before the tragic flight and told him not to do any funny stuff with her student on board because she didn't want her student to learn any bad habits. However, she also reported that she had heard about Robbie doing a barrel roll in one of the planes, and when she was asked if she thought the flight school owner had any knowledge of this, she said, absolutely not. The NTSB's probable cause placed the blame squarely on Robbie, but as I said in the beginning, that was only half of the story because I also blame a system that pushes pilots to upgrade as fast as possible. And I think this is an extreme example of what can happen when you know a pilot is breaking the rules, but you don't try to stop it. And I hope this debrief has been helpful. Be sure to check out this other debrief on the screen about a different flight instructor that got his student killed, and I'll see you next time.